And I want to um, to thank, first of all, Ben Loring of the Center for Eurasian, Russian, and East European Studies, uh, right here in this building. Uh, we had planned from almost the week I got here and, and to Georgetown to collaborate together, and now we've been able to realize it, and hopefully it will be the first of many, uh, because we have many shared interests, and, um, and, and now, you know, the Central Asia has suddenly become part of the Middle East. I mean, go figure, right? We knew it was elastic, but um, when it gets to China, we'll start. Well, it actually would be, but anyway. Um, okay, so Benjamin Loring is Associate Director for the Center for Eurasian, Russian, and East European Studies at Georgetown. He's been here since 2012. Prior to starting his current position, he conducted research on a grant from the National Center for East European and Eurasian Research and taught world history as an adjunct professor at Fitchburg State College and Lesley College in Massachusetts. His most recent article, Colonizers with Party Cards, Soviet Internal Colonialism in Central Asia, 17, 1917 to 1939, appeared in Kritika, Explorations in Russian and Eurasian History. He received his PhD in Comparative History from Brandeis and completed a postdoc fellowship at Ceres right here in 2009. So I'd like to welcome Ben, who wants to give you some overview of resources and the historical background for your day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, uh, I first wanted to... Uh, oh, we'll bring up thing. I'm sorry. Oh, sure. Uh, I just wanted to thank uh, Susan for inviting me. It's really a pleasure to be here. My job uh, during the day is most, consists mostly of being on email and looking at Excel spreadsheets. Uh, so it's, it's really a pleasure to get back to um, what I uh, was trained as, which is uh, as a historian to talk about things that I really love talking about. Um, uh, I, um, I think that uh, the, as far as resources are concerned, I, um, I think that uh, most of them you can find in the packet. It has been a little bit of time since I've been out. Um, but in particular, the One Belt, One Road um, resource, I would definitely highly recommend. Um, it seems like a really good one. Um, today, I'm going to speak about the Central Asian Silk Road in modern times, um, by which I mean the 19th and 20th centuries, uh, when it was Russia's Silk Road. Um, the, um, most history textbooks will describe the Central uh, Asian Silk Road uh, as retaining its world historic importance up through about the 1400s. Um, at that time, a number of factors contributed to its decline, including um, political fragmentation among the uh, various uh, countries, um, the various uh, empires of the region, um, the fall of Constantinople, um, by which uh, China lost its major trading partner in the West, um, and the advent of the European tra ocean-going trading empires from the 1500s on. Um, and at that point, Central Asia di disappears from the map, uh, and most textbooks make virtually no reference to it uh, from then on. If you read a world history textbook, it's like Central Asia doesn't exist, basically, for, from then on. Um, in fact, uh, the Central Asian Silk Road never went anywhere. It continued to be a place of, uh, through which goods and people passed and through which uh, ideas and, and cultural forms spread. Um, while the Silk Road no longer had the importance for Europe and China in 1800, in other words, um, that it did in, let's say, 1300 or 1200, um, it uh, nonetheless was fundamental to the economy of the region, um, and migration was a fundamental um, feature of its makeup. Um, it continued to be a place of movements of goods and people, in other words. Um, and it was the, the basis, uh, and this, this movement of goods and people was the basis for the nations that we see today. Uh, uh, this is a, actually a picture of um, a, a caravan sarai in the, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and then as it was 500 years before, um, there continued to be, to be um, a great deal of, this, this was the lifeblood of the economy of the region, and it was the way in which um, uh, goods and people spread. This was in Bukhara, but it was um, a caravansarai for the Indian, uh, South Asian um, uh, merchants. Um, in the 19th and 20th century, uh, trade and mig migration came under Russian rule, however. Um, Trade made Central Asia a part of Russia for more than a century, uh, but it also made Central Asia subordinate to Russia. 
And migration assisted in um, Russia's economic, uh, sorry, Russia's economic development and also Central Asia's economic development, but it also disrupted Central Asian societies. And so today I'm going to talk about the Russian Silk Road, the Silk Road under Russian rule. Um, uh, integration with Russia, which I'll date from sort of 1730 up to the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, has created the present day countries of Central Asia that we know today. They're known as the Stans, uh, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Kyrgyzstan, and Tajikistan. Um, and you'll be hearing more uh, about their present day challenges uh, from Ambassador Norland in a little bit. Um, <coughs> since the dawn of recorded history, or uh, even before then, um, Central Asia has been always a multilingual and multicultural region with crisscrossing trade routes, and various successive invasions um, have brought um, many different peoples to the region and deposited them. Uh, the Persians, the Turks, the Arabs, the Mongols, and a number of smaller groups who were, came along trade routes, such as Jews and Armenians, and, and countless others. And the cities of Central Asia served as centers of trade and administration. Um, and, uh, and while uh, they were where most of the population lived, most of the land mass of Central Asia, these bright white areas that you see on this map of, of the ethnic groups of Central Asia, uh, were inhabited by nomadic peoples, um, uh, especially in these regions that were more uh, uh, sort of farther away from rivers. This is a present-day ethnic ma uh, map of the region, um, but it, it, it sort of demonstrates its uh, vast uh, uh, linguistic and, and cultural diversity. Um, since the 10th century, of course, uh, Central Asia uh, was uh, predominantly Muslim, um, but there's always been a great deal of religious diversity. There are great uh, many Buddhist, Christian, um, animistic, and Jewish uh, religious sites in the region. Um, starting in the 1700s, um, by that time, the old trading empires had basically fragmented into smaller states called khanates. Um, and political infighting among various families uh, kept the region fragmented um, and divided. In the north, um, the Kazakh tribes that had dominated the steppe regions uh, for a long time, uh, they're in this sort of area here, um, uh, were uh, unable to prevent invading, invading groups from what is today China from coming in and, and pushing them over. Um, and down in the south, you had a bunch of somewhat related uh, families were um, the uh, settled oases and trade routes. Um, we started to have lots of invasions starting in, in, uh, in the late 1700s and going especially um, uh, up into the sort of uh, mid-1700s. Mid uh, and uh, it pushed a lot of the, the Kazakhs and a lot of these nomadic groups up against Russia for the first time. Um, Russians and the peoples of Central Asia had known of each other for a long time. Um, they had, there had been uh, trade relations, there had, uh, the Kazakhs had participated in the Mongol invasions, um, and, um, uh, and, uh, and Russia had been in contact with various different nomadic tribes uh, for, um, uh, since, um, really since it's um, the first evidence of, uh, of Russian uh, Statehood back in back in the uh, in, in the 900s and, and, and 1000 uh, BC, uh, AD, but now the Russian state was actually coming up face to face on to the step. Um, the Russian state had been expanding for about two or three centuries, and for the first time, um, it was uh, dealing with Kazakhs on its immediate frontier. They were moving west as they tried to find safer places to. Um, to live, to get away from uh, some of the, um, inv uh, the invaders. And the Russians were, were moving east as um, their empire expanded and they, um, their population grew. Um, from the beginning, Russians were uh, concerned about migration and trade. Um, they started to build a string of fortresses along the uh, Kazakh, Kazakh steppe to protect themselves from raids against nomadic um, uh, nomadic tribes. Uh, they also allowed some Kazakhs to settle behind this line of fortresses, 
um, in order to uh, uh, get away from uh, 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 the, um, the the marauding um, uh, groups to the to the east that were uh, disrupting them. Um, once Kazakhs swore fealty to the Russian Tsar, they were allowed to settle within the Russian uh, Empire. And so it's at that point that we start to see uh, the Russians actually uh, having Central Asians settling within their, their empire um, and, um, and becoming a part of the, the Russian polity. Uh, Russians were also very concerned about the caravan trade with China and Persia, so the fortresses were, were kind of a, a stop off on the way for, um, for a, um, a lot of these, uh, uh, for, for a lot of the caravans that were on their way to, um, to some of these areas to the east and south. Um, this, what, what follows next, this is actually a pretty good um, set of maps that uh, demonstrate the evolution over a period of about a century and a half of <coughs> the movement of this line of, of Russian forts down um, into Central Asia and the various groups that lived there. Uh, there's always a lot going on in these maps, but, uh, uh, but the important thing is to, uh, is to just sort of see this, 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 this evolution. Um, the fortresses that the Russians were building also served as uh, a place to house soldiers, and they served as a, a center of for military settlement, especially uh, for this group of, of Russians known as Cossacks. And, uh, People who know a little bit about Russia often uh, think of Cossacks as brutal soldiers on horseback, and that they certainly were, but it's important to note that Cossacks were settlers who formed a kind of buffer zone. Um, they settled in the areas around the Russian Empire with their families and helped to protect the Russian Empire from uh, raids. It was, it was kind of a way of, of settling um, well-armed, highly organized, um, uh, uh, autonomous kinds of uh, settlers around on your periphery and so you can keep uh, other groups out. Um, and so Cossacks became the first uh, Euro Europeans, the first Slavic settlers in, um, to Central Asia, uh, in part to kind of secure this border um, that we saw. Um, there was a great deal, as I mentioned, of trade. Uh, this is uh, an image of a, uh, a caravan, a camel caravan in Orienburg, which is in, in what is today's um, uh, southern Siberia. Um, but as you can see, um, there's a, a mosque there. Um, and this was an area where both Kazakhs and a number of Muslim Central Asians, as well as Russians, were living. Uh, it was a stop off along the way uh, to China or to Persia or to uh, India. Um, here's another image from the, the late 1800s in Troitsk, which is um, in northern uh, Kazakhstan today. Um, so from about uh, the 17, 1730 to the 1850s, the northern part of Central Asia, what is today Kazakhstan, was slowly absorbed rather than conquered outright. Um, to be sure, there was certainly a lot of conflict between Kazakhs and Russians, um, and uh, there, were, there were eight Kazakh uprisings in a little more than a century, but it, this process went in fits and starts. Uh, there uh, were always uh, Russians on hand to put down any rebellion, and that's the, the critical thing to bear in mind, that the Russians had the technological and organizational advantage to keep pushing. Um, but it's important to note that there was also uh, uh, the there was also an appeal that the Russian state had. The Russian state offered uh, security, um, and it offered uh, protection from uh, stronger neighbors, more um, more aggressive neighbors. And so, while Central Asia remained fragmented, while uh, there were all of these little groups of, uh, competing with each other and fighting each other, the the Russian state was able to grow. Uh, in part because um, there were a lot of groups willing to work with it. Um, this changed a great deal uh, in the 1860s, and that's when the Russians went from having um, this slow process of moving into the area into a determined effort to conquer it. And we start to see, uh, in, starting in, in um, 
in, uh, 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 first of all, a lot more aggressive fort building start and, and, and movements down um, into the sort of settled riverine areas of Central Asia start in, in the 1850s, and then in 1865, um, an invasion that didn't stop until basically the whole region was under uh, its control. There are various different reasons for the Ru Russia's sudden interest in Central Asia and suddenly coming in to the region. One was uh, the Russian defeat in the Crimean War. Um, uh, this was a really humiliating uh, event for Russia as it lost out to the more advanced Brit British and French empires. And uh, to a certain extent, um, Russia wanted to, uh, uh, there were Russians who wanted to sort of put a win on the board to um, show themselves to be a real empires by uh, winning in a different uh, uh, part of the world. Um, another related reason was uh, ongoing rivalry with Great Britain. This also followed the Crimean War, but it, it was sort of a, a part of this ongoing rivalry that they had. Um, Britain conquered Afghanistan in the 1840s. Uh, this is Afghanistan here, this is sort of uh, uh, British India, and Britain was um, deeply involved in Afghanistan and had um, uh, fought a number of wars, conquered it in the 1840s, and seemed poised to take uh, Central Asia from right out under uh, the Russians, who are um, in this map, sort of positioned up on the top. Uh, uh, this is what Rudyard Kipling called the Great Game. He's the one who came up with that name. And I, I have, has anyone read or, or knows of the uh, the novel Kim by Rudyard Kipling? Yes. Um, so this is about this rivalry. Uh, but the reason the, the reason that the Russians had that I want to focus on is is, is trade, um, and in particular cotton. Uh, cotton was an incredibly important commodity for the world economy, uh, and in the mid 1800s. If you think about where cotton came from, it came from the southern United States, it came from the West Indies, uh, it came from South Asia, from India, um, and this trade was largely controlled by Britain. British textile manufacturers were at a great advantage when it came to getting their hands on raw cotton, um, and they were able to make a great deal from it. Um, but at the same time, uh, Central Asians had grown cotton since the Middle Ages. Uh, and with the approach of the Russian trade routes, these caravans moving down, the biggest traded good uh, in the, uh, even before the Russian invasion uh, was uh, cotton. Um, it was the region's biggest export, um, even, even uh, before the Russians had invaded. Um, by conquering this territory, Russia gained an opportunity to break away from these disadvantageous tr terms of trade with its arch rival Britain and get its own cotton colonies. Um, and the spike in, in worldwide cotton prices that really advantaged Britain during the U.S. Civil War, in fact, was one of the, uh, one of the things that, that, that drove this. Um, if you look, um, this is a, a map, uh, uh, this is, sorry, a chart of Russian trade in Central Asia. Um, and from the, uh, as you can see, from 1840 to 1867, over the period of a quarter century, um, trade grows uh, roughly uh, uh, fourfold or fivefold. Um, and, and here, between 1860 and 1865, it, it more than doubles. Um, and that's because um, uh, of, in, 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 in no small part, because of the US Civil War. Um, uh, cotton wasn't the only region for the Russian conquest in the 1860s and 70s. Um, but uh, the empire certainly benefited from it. And uh, having this Russian, uh, their own source of uh, cotton, uh, made it into one of the most important industrial products, uh, processed cloth uh, being one of the most important um, industrial products uh, for Russian uh, manufacturers. Um, there, uh, there was also going the other way. Um, once in control of Central Asia, Russians had free reign of the markets of Central Asia, which meant they could trade not only with the, the Central Asians who lived there, but also with uh, the various other peoples of the region, Persia, uh, Afghanistan, uh, even China, uh, who were, were there to trade. Um, Central Asian markets were um, still, in the mid-1800s, vibrant centers of, of regional trade, even if they didn't have this great worldwide significance that we uh, 
that we, we know they had in, in the Middle Ages. Um, Russian trade group, goods included uh, manufactured cloth, again they were exporting it to the region, uh, porcelain, and machinery, in particular Singer sewing machines were quite popular at the end of the 1800s and early 1900s. Uh, there was a Singer sewing machine factory in St. Petersburg and, and Central Asia was one of its big markets. Um, here's another uh, picture of uh, a mar uh, sort of marketplace near the center of, of Bukhara, which is one of the great cities of Central Asia in uh, the 1890s. Uh, Along with trade, uh, Central Asia became a destination for uh, settlers from the European regions of the Russian Empire. Um, they could be peasants who didn't have land in Central, uh, Central Russia and moved into um, Central Asia uh, in order to get it, or members of religious minorities who were fleeing persecution. Um, this is uh, a family of ethnic German settlers from the Volga River area who are um, uh, in, in this picture in Akmala province, which is uh, near the um, uh, present-day capital of Kazakhstan in Astana. Um, and, uh, and actually there were a number of ethnic Germans who uh, had been living in the Russian Empire and who migrated to Central Asia at this time. Um, when I lived in Kyrgyzstan um, in the, uh, about 10 years ago, I, uh, I remember visiting a village that um, had been inhabited since the 1880s by uh, Mennonite Germans. Um, and, and many of you know the Mennonite migrations to um, the prairie provinces of, of Canada or, or, the, or the plains of the states of the US. Um, it, it was the part of the same group um, and uh, who, had, who had migrated to some of these, actually geographically not all that dissimilar places um, in Central Asia. Um, uh, the Russian imperial authorities, of course, had to be very careful in managing this situation. Um, they were allowing large amounts of uh, settlers to come into the region. Uh, they wanted the uh, benefits of the trade. They wanted the security of having um, uh, loyal settlers nearby. But they did not want to upset the Central Asian population. Um, and they came up with a solution similar to the one the British um, did in many of their uh, colonial possessions, such as India, um, that there would essentially be two societies. There would be a, uh, a Central Asian society um, that would be, insofar as possible, uh, undisturbed by uh, colonialism, and then there would be um, a, a transplanted um, local uh, Russian uh, group society that would be um, quite a lot like um, the Russian uh, homeland. Uh, and so there was this deliberate attempt to keep these two group, groups separate. Um, the Russians even forbade uh, Christian missionaries from proselytizing to Muslims in uh, the Russian possessions of Central Asia. That did not happen with Muslim populations in uh, Central or, or in other parts of Russia uh, where um, uh, proselytizing was, was encouraged. Um, as uh, the Orthodox Church was the, the state religion. Um, uh, this all changed, however, uh, with the uh, railroads. This sort of delicate balance of keeping the two populations separate really changed with the development of a modern transportation and therefore a modern infrastructure for moving goods and people uh, along it, a modern sort of trade infrastructure. Um, trade increased dramatically. Um, Railroads cut down on the time it took to get from St. Petersburg to uh, Tashkent from um, a couple months to um, a couple weeks, or even less. Um, I, I think it could be made in about eight days um, towards the end of the 1800s and the early 1900s. Um, uh, and we start to move, see massive amounts of goods moving in and out of the region. It was just a different scale altogether. Uh, the cotton trade also boomed um, as Russians introduced American varieties of cotton into the region. And uh, although the American varieties were more productive, they weren't native to the region. They required much more water. Um, and this required um, uh, the Russians to develop a new and more modern infrastructure for um, uh, irrigating. That new modern infrastructure, however, ended up draining a lot of the water out of the rivers and 
because this policy was basically continued up into the present day, that's why we uh, have disasters such as the RLC disaster. Many of you probably know that the RLC has pretty much ceased to exist, and it's because all of the rivers, um, these rivers here, the Amudarya and the Sirdarya rivers, no longer flow really into the RLC. This is now a desert, and it's all because um, cotton takes up so much water and they've developed so much cotton in the region. Um, so it's had very grave consequences for, for the environment. Um, but uh, So the Silk Road really became the cotton road for Russia. This, this cotton growing area was a vital part of the, the, uh, the empire um, and the railroads were really key. Uh, along with the railroads, however, came more settlers and the trickle turned into a flood and soon um, by the early 1900s uh, tens of thousands of settlers were coming every year. Um, uh, this was really unpopular with the Central Asians who lived there um, and um, although they, and they, they, you start to see a, a great deal of a sense of resistance to um, uh, a sense of Russian rule uh, in large part because of um, the great changes that were happening to Central Asian society at the time. Um, this is a um, uh, leader of a rebellion who was uh, in uh, Fergana Valley in uh, 1897. His name is uh, Dukchi. Um, and uh, he was in, uh, in Ishan, a, a religious man, uh, a, a, a religious leader. Who, who led uh, a massive uprising against um, the Russian uh, army uh, there, the Russian, Russian administration. Uh, it was something that the Russians, because they had such bad knowledge of Central Asians, because there was so little integration with society, the Russians did not see coming at all. Um, they quickly put it down, um, and brutally put it down, um, and, uh, and he was, of course, um, executed. Um, but uh, over time, you start to see more and more of this sort of thing. Uh, increased contacts with Russia also brought about other things, such as revolutionary ideas, modern ideas, ideas, anti-colonial ideas, and closer contact between Central Asians and other subject peoples of the, the, the Russian state and beyond. Um, so in the early 1900s, you start seeing the first Russian-educated Central Asians advocating for greater autonomy and rights within the Russian Empire started to advocate for some of the anti-colonial policies um, uh, that, in, uh, that would, would resist some of these changes. Um, many of these Central Asians had benefited from ties uh, with uh, Central Asia, and you'd sort of, sort of see a, a, a classic story of the education of, for example, this, this man in the center, uh, who is his name, um, uh, Bukai Khanov, um, I believe, uh, Ajib, or Ahmed Bukai Khanov. Um, and uh, he was educated in Orenburg, that city that I showed you uh, earlier that is in southern uh, uh, Siberia. Uh, he uh, had a Russian education. He started um, a great deal of publishing in the late 1800s. And he helped, along with um, colleagues, he supported some of the, the Russian um, sort of progressive or, 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 or democratic parties uh, in, the, in the Russian em Empire. Um, but he also um, had a very clear anti-colonial, anti-Russian uh, agenda, uh, anti-Russian empire agenda, I should say, uh, that, uh, that, that sought to um, extend greater rights, greater autonomy to the Central Asians. Um, and this, this new generation would be very critical when the time came uh, for, for changes. Um, the First World War was that time. Um, it really brought things to a head for the Russian Empire, and the Central Asians uh, were the ones who felt it first. Because of the war, the price of foodstuffs went through the roof. Uh, Central Asians, meanwhile, were being encouraged to grow cotton. They were being paid a lot for cotton. They were not. Uh, their irrigation was all built for cotton. They were no longer able to feed themselves, and so they were importing food from uh, Russia. Uh, and uh, with the war, the price of grain increasing, um, Central Asia lost the ability to feed themselves. They couldn't sell enough cotton to buy food. And um, on top of that, the Russian military started to draft Central Asians 
uh, for the war effort to help out at the front. Um, and this led to a massive rebellion in, 18, in 1916 uh, that targeted the Russian state and the Russian settlers. Um, the first things that the insurgents did, of course, was to destroy the railroads, to destroy the telegraphs, to cut the lines with Russia, um, uh, and, and, and cut off that connection. Uh, the rebellion spread across Central Asia. Um, it started down here uh, in the, the cotton growing areas of what is today the, uh, the Fergana Valley. It spread to uh, places where nomadic herdsmen lived um, in, in, in Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan, and then it spread to uh, uh, what is today Turkmenistan. It affected all the groups all at once. Um, and um, the Russians responded with pulling the force. Uh, ultimately, about 2,000 Russians died, and the but the Central Asian losses were astronomical. I've read conservative estimates of a quarter million, um, but it could easily be twice, twice that. And this is out of a population of about 6 million. So that's 5 to 10, and perhaps as high as 15% of the population perishes um, at this time. Many, uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of people flee to uh, China, as you can see by these kind of arrows here uh, going in. Um, and it affects certain groups more than others. It's about, about um, a quarter of, or a third, Hard to, it's hard to tell based on the, on the historical record, of the Kyrgyz died, about a quarter to a third of the Kazakhs perished. And the fighting didn't stop until after the Russian revolutions of 1917 and the assumption of power by um, Vladimir Lenin. It took the Bolsheviks more than five years to subdue Central Asia, and here too the railroads were key. Uh, the Bolsheviks controlled uh, the railroads and the cities, um, and they could therefore put various, uh, they could put uh, army units into the field to fight against the, the insurgents. And so you see them moving down into these areas first and then taking um, the fight uh, to people in the mountains later. Um, uh, the Bolsheviks, of course, had, however, a very different ideology from uh, those of, uh, that of, of the Russian Empire. Um, they supported liberation movements of colonized peoples in the world, in Africa and Asia, against European imperial powers. And within the former Russian Empire, they promoted the rights of formerly oppressed ethnic minorities. And the ide ideology of equality among the peoples of the Soviet Union had a lot of appeal to these groups. And as Professor Igman will likely describe later, they, they preached a kind of developmental, the, the, the Bolsheviks preached a kind of developmental uh, Marxist developmental modernism, you could say, where uh, there were all kinds of peoples of the world. Uh, they existed at different stages of development along a continuum that went from uh, feudalism to capitalism to socialism and to communism. And um, they, the, the Bolsheviks believed that they needed to help groups that were along that continuum, whether they were um, developed or not, to reach that sort of uh, ultimate communist um, state. When it came to rights and privileges, the Bolsheviks sought to promote um, what, they, what they called so-called backward peoples even more. They sought to give them extra help, as they saw it, um, with preferential policies in hiring and education, languages, social services, and in regional administration. Um, and Central Asians were, for, for Russians, uh, for the for the uh, Bolsheviks, uh, the backward people that they needed to kind of help advance, um, and some of the intellectuals whom we saw before uh, saw opportunities in the with the Bolsheviks to, um, to 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 help their people and to advance their cause, and so one of these um, I'm going to name two um, just uh, Kyrgyz uh, intellectuals. Um, who, uh, who took part in this movement. This was um, Abdukarin Sadikov, who was a government clerk and translator uh, before the revolution. Um, he became a, um, a member of uh, a lot of the parties that uh, people like Bukhanov were starting. Um, and um, when the Bolsheviks came along, he joined up with their cause. He went on to create um, 
uh, what we uh, the the Kyrgyz Soviet Republic, and and, and uh, many today call him the, the father of modern Kyrgyzstan. Um, this is uh, Yusuf Abdurakmanov. He was um, just 16 when the uh, revolutions of when the October Revolution happened, um, and he had fled with his parents to China during the rebellion. He returned a year later and worked as a stable boy for Russian officers in what is today Kazakhstan. And when the revolution swept into Central Asia in early 1918, he joined up with the Red Army and he helped to uh, fight in the civil war alongside the, the, the Bolsheviks, alongside the communists from Russia. Uh, the Bolsheviks were very spread very thin in Central Asia. Um, they worked out an implicit deal, therefore, with leaders like Abdurakmanov, like um, Siddiqov. Um, the Central Asians who supported them, who supported the, the Red Army and supported the party, the Communist Party, uh, would get their own territory. Um, they would um, be able to control their edu own education. They would be able to develop their language. They would have some local autonomy, some regional self-governance, some preferential treatment in hiring and social services. Um, and they, they were promised a certain degree of control over their own, academic, uh, their own economic development. In return, they would have to be, continue to be a part of the Soviet Union. They would have to continue to be a part of the Soviet state. And that is pretty much how we got the five republics that we know today. Um, all, in every republic, there were people like, Ab, uh, like Abdurakhmanov, like Siddiqov, who um, advocated for their own rights, said, hey, we are the Kyrgyz, we are the Uzbeks, we are the Kazakhs, and we demand our own territory. We demand to have our own language in this territory. We demand to control our own schooling in this territory. And, this, uh, and um, the, the Soviet state basically gave them these territories. Um, it, this was a very contentious and drawn out process. It took about uh, more, than, more than a decade to complete. Um, and, uh, and there was a lot of negotiation among the various different groups in Central Asia because there was disagreement over what was a Tajik or what was an Uzbek or what was a Kyrgyz. Um, but by the end of the 1920s, each of the five republics that we know today um, as the stands uh, had come into being, and each became home um, to the nations that we think of today when we think of uh, Kazakhstan or Kyrgyzstan or Tajikistan. Um, however, this all occurred in a larger context, and there was a big contradiction, contradiction between the aspirations of these national groups and um, the Russian Bolsheviks who were in control in Moscow. The, this, this contradiction had a lot to do with trade, again, and migration. It had a lot to do with um, the economics. The Soviet economy was devastated after the Civil War, and the Bolsheviks, under first Lenin and then Stalin, needed to rebuild and develop the economy to compete with Western democracies. They were, um, as they saw it, in a fight of, in, in, in a world revolutionary process, they were in a fight against um, uh, capitalist imperialism, and therefore they needed to develop economically as quickly as possible. Um, this made it easiest and, and imperative almost for, for the communists to fall back on old habits. Central Asia again became a supplier of raw materials for Russia. It was not allowed to develop as um, on its own. It had to be again in this role of being um, a supplier of, of uh, of cotton and, and other goods. And again, we see the building of railroads. Um, they really facilitated this in the 1920s. The Soviet government built the Turkestan-Siberian Railroad, which ran through um, what is today Kazakhstan. Uh, in a large part, this was to facilitate this train, trade of grain and cotton coming out of uh, Central Asia. And it was to bring commodities out and, and to a much lesser extent, bring um, finished goods in. Um, and the Central Asian communist leaders were unable to shield their populations from uh, devastating policies, uh, such as collectivization. Oh, okay, here is um, uh, the first train that went along the Turkestan Siberian Railroad. You can see everyone's cheering. Um, and the, really, the belief was that this was going to be a great boon to the, the Soviet state uh, because um, it would uh, make Central Asia 
in the words of one communist, into the base for Russian industrialization. I mean, they really saw this as, um, uh, and, and did, made no secret about it, as just bringing things out of Central Asia so that they could um, build up Russia. Um, Question. Yes. As resources, basically, as a resource area, raw resources, and with the manufacturing going on in sort of European Russia or something, I mean, is that the idea? Yeah. Um, it's basically that, uh, so um, it, I'll, I'll take five minutes to just describe the, how it all worked. The, uh, the Russians needed lots of machinery from the West. They didn't have the capacity to build up their own machinery. Um, they needed advanced goods from the West that they needed to buy with hard currency that was all pegged back in the 1920s to the gold standard. Um, and the way that the things that they could ship out to, to get that currency were grain, oil, furs, and textiles. That was 90% of it, was basically their exports were just those four things. And the only manufactured good among those are textiles. At the same time, they're spending huge amounts. At, during one year, it was a third of their imports. The value of their imports was raw cotton. And so they're importing raw cotton to ship out textiles to buy machinery to build up their industry. How do they keep from spending so much precious money on raw cotton? They have to grow their own cotton. And so that's when they say, OK, Central Asia, you grow cotton. We're going to reduce how much we're spending on raw cotton outside the country, and we're going to buy more machinery with that money. And it, it wasn't trivial. I mean, it was, there was one year in which they were paying twice as much for raw cotton as they were for machinery. And they must have been thinking, gee, if we could only you know, replace that need for cotton, we would be able to buy so much more. We'd be able to industrialize so much faster. Does that answer your question? Sure. Sort of the way we think about oil today, we can't, well, <laughs> things have changed recently. But right. you know, we have to buy oil in order to do things, have it ourselves. Right, right. Or you know, this is. Actually, some of the same thinking behind why we um, didn't want oil to go out of the country. We, didn't have, we weren't allowed to export it until a few weeks ago. Um, we, we wanted to keep the prices low at home so that we'd have cheaper gasoline here, um, even if that meant um, that our own exporters of oil couldn't export it overseas. Um, it was really to, to help us out. You know, we, we created this barrier. This is sort of almost, almost the reverse. It's like, you know, we, we need to import it in, um, and we need to try and create as much domestic capacity as possible so that we can, we can uh, replace that need. Yes. Didn't the oil industry also start in Central Asia and Baku, um, around the Caspian, not in Siberia? As well? Yes. Um, uh, yeah, Baku is, is, was really a place where um, the uh, Nobel family, I believe, uh, I did, did a lot. Um, they uh, uh, had uh, a great deal there. And um, uh, of of of, uh, of oil production, and, and Baku was just naturally a really great place for it. I mean, if you go there today, you see oil derricks everywhere. Um, I was I was there in the, in the mid '90s, and um, they had old Soviet ones, but it was it was there were the, it was like South Texas or you know, parts of Texas where it's just you know every few feet <laughs> there, there, it seems like there's another oil derrick. Um, and, and back in those days, you could just dig a hole, a ditch, and there would be oil. I mean, it was, it was just below the surface. Um, and so, yeah, it was a very, um, it was a very important commodity, but it wasn't, uh, uh, oil wasn't as, as important an export um, at certain times. Uh, it sort of depended uh, when you were talking. There were times, in other words, when cotton cloth was actually more important. But in, in, the, in the way that the, the communists were thinking about this, it's like we want to develop, we don't want to just be a colony to the rest of the world. We're fine with keeping Central Asians as a colony, but we don't, ourselves don't want to be a colony to the rest of the world. We want to be exporting finished goods. We want to be developing our industry. We want to be exporting more, more, more high value uh, items. Um, and this is the, really what they were thinking in the 1920s. Um, and they were, uh, they, they were, they were uh, thinking, even though they were communists, they were thinking in terms of kind of capitalist trade, the way we think about it. Um, the way economists in this country think about it now. Um, uh, so the Central Asian communist leaders could not 
shield their population, shield their, uh, their people from devastating economic policies, such as collectivization. Um, and these policies led to mass starvation, you know, just as they did in, in Ukraine and other parts of the Soviet Union starting in the early 1930s. Um, and we have uh, hundreds of thousands more Central Asians perishing. Uh, but Moscow was in charge. If Moscow needed grain or livestock or cotton, Central Asians had to send it. Um, and so while Central Asians were able to create their own republics, their own um, uh, government institutions inside the Soviet Union, their own schools, their own languages and cultures, um, they were still to fulfill the same subordinate economic role that they had during um, the imperial times. Uh, so once again, Central Asia was a colony inside the Soviet system. Um, later on, we start to see um, Central Asia become a source for many other things. Oil and gas are among them. We start to see uh, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan becoming centers for oil and gas production. Um, uh, gold, copper, iron, bauxite, which is used in aluminum, and uranium. Um, in fact, the, uh, the uranium that went into the first Soviet atomic weapon was mined in Central Asia. Um, and especially after, um, uh, I'm sorry, this is a, a chart uh, of major ethnic groups in Kazakhstan. Uh, and what you see is um, during the early 1930s, Central Asians disproportionately suffered um, in Kazakhstan, for example. Um, as a result of these famines that I was describing. Um, and you see the population of Kazakhs just plummeting. Um, uh, Russians, who most, uh, mo most of whom, uh, or many of whom, lived in cities, uh, remained relatively unaffected. Um, Ukrainians, who were settlers who generally lived in, 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 the, in the countryside, were also affected, but not as much as the, the Kazakhs. And so um, there was a really a, a big, um, it was, it was, the Central Asians who bore the brunt of the, the, the famines that were happening in the 1930s. Um, then with um, the um, emptying out of, the, um, uh, uh, of, of many of these regions, the, the incredible um, uh, disruptions of the Civil War and, and the period afterwards, uh, you had a lot of uh, migrants coming into the region, um, especially after, again, the completion of these new railroads. Um, and the, uh, they were from the rest of the Soviet Union. Um, so in the 1930s, many um, people who were fleeing um, famine in other parts of the Soviet Union came to Central Asia, um, and especially to the southern uh, parts of it. And then starting in 1935, the, the state itself starts to force peoples from other parts of the, Central Asia, uh, 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 of the Soviet Union into Central Asia. Um, these were the so-called punished peoples. Uh, it started with um, the Koreans who are living along what is today the, the Russian border with North Korea. Uh, they start to be sent out of that region. They're viewed as a security threat um, and moved into uh, Central Asia, in particular Uzbekistan um, and, uh, and, and, and Kazakhstan. Um, in uh, 1940, you start to see um, the Poles and some Germans and um, people in the Baltic republics uh, are shipped out um, from the areas where they lived, um, which were close to the Soviet border with um, uh, what was then uh, Germany. Um, this was af after the start of World War uh, II. Um, they were seen as a security threat. They were sent out. This is a picture of the, the um, uh, evacuation of Poles from um, the regions. They were brought into Central Asia, put into villages there. Um, and then in World War II, you see a great deal of, of people coming, uh, Germans um, and uh, peoples from the Caucasus, who were viewed by the Soviet state as security threats um, and put as far away from, um, as they could be from any front line so that they wouldn't disrupt um, uh, the war effort. Um, and here's a map that kind of shows you the, the various peoples that got moved around at that time. Uh, and what you see uh, here are the Balts, here are the Poles. This is this is unfortunately in Russian. Um, uh, there were uh, various other groups um, sent out from uh, the, the sort of border regions uh, on the, along the western border of the Soviet Union and sent mostly to Central Asia, some to Siberia as well. 
And this is the little line for the Koreans who were sent from, uh, from over uh, near what is today um, uh, China and, 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 and Korea. Pardon me, what was the term you used for these people? Something? Punished. The punished, punished people. people. Uh, they were the punished peoples. Um, ethnic minorities who were suspected of disloyalty and were moved from um, uh, other parts of the Soviet Union to Central Asia, um, basically to keep them out of the way, keep them from um, being, uh, being a problem. Um, uh, in the, in the post-war era, um, after 1945, um, there was a different kind of uh, migration to the region. Uh, you started to see uh, a lot of skilled workers coming, uh, particularly miners, um, uh, engineers, uh, people who worked in industry, and building up um, uh, the, the, uh, some of the, the industries in Central Asia. Central Asia was still producing raw materials, but they just needed uh, engineers now to do it. Uh, they were still, for example, processing cotton, but they needed to build new um, cotton processing plants, things like that. You also saw a great deal um, of intellectuals coming to Central Asia um, to open up some of the universities, some of the teachers' institutes, some of the hospitals. Um, uh, people who had higher education were basically being sent there um, in order to, uh, to, to provide some of the benefits of, 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 of the social state, the welfare state that the Soviets had created. And often these were themselves minorities. So for example, it was very hard for a Jewish uh, doctor to get a job in Moscow. Um, there was a lot of institutionalized anti-Semitism. But a Jewish doctor could go to Central Asia and become head of a hospital. Um, because there was just, it was, there was sort of less competition there. Um, there were certain places where it was really desirable to live in the Soviet Union. And, but if you were willing to go to some of these less desirable places, and many people considered Central Asia a less desirable place, then you could actually get ahead. And so you see a good deal of um, in-migration by uh, educated professionals then. And Central Asia cities started to grow because these are modern institutions, modern industry, modern um, uh, uh, <coughs> the, the trappings of modern life, and they become more and more, more Soviet. So Tashkent, for example, um, this is a, a picture of Tashkent in 1971, um, uh, starts to look very much like a Russian city. Um, if you look back to, if you remember back to some of the pictures of bazaars, um, uh, this this is a very different image. Um, there's you know trolleys and buses and um, and and all the trappings of uh, and a metro and all the trappings of of, of of a Soviet city. There's another picture of Tashkent and it has um, a man in Uzbek traditional Uzbek uh, uh, clothing uh, walking along one of the wide boulevards there. Uh, here, this is a picture um, I couldn't resist from uh, Frunze, what is today Bishkek. It's a, a movie theater that is today called Russia. And uh, Bishkek was essentially a, uh, a Russian language city. I mean, these cities were in the middle of Central Asia, but any, everybody in them spoke Russian. And in fact, um, when I lived in, in Bishkek and I was doing my research, uh, my friends who were from Bishkek did not speak Kyrgyz. They didn't know any Kyrgyz. I actually knew some Kyrgyz. They were really impressed that, that an American would actually be able to speak any Kyrgyz because they didn't speak it at all. Although if they were to go out of the city five or ten miles, um, they'd be in a village where they spoke only Kyrgyz. Um, and so there's this big discrepancy between um, these urban populations which resembled the rest of the Soviet Union, which had all of these migrants from all over the Soviet Union living in them, um, and that their descendants living in them, um, and the Central Asian population who lived in the countryside, who lived in villages, um, and who uh, linguistically, culturally were so distinct from what was going on uh, in the rest of, of the Soviet Union. Um, so in, in 19, so this created a lot of problems in 19, uh, when, when the Soviet Union broke, broke apart. Uh, the old Central Asian uh, Silk Road had become this colony, but it had become this colony with these little pockets of, of, uh, of a modern state in them. And when everything broke apart, uh, what had sustained those little pockets disappeared. 
and many of, if, if not most, of the uh, so-called Europeans, the, the Slavs and others who had moved into the region, uh, moved out. Virtually all of the German population of the region, for example, of Central Asia, we're talking you know, millions of people, three, four million people, uh, left and went back to Germany. I mean, wholesale. Entire German neighborhoods were filled with um, these, these, uh, these returning Germans. Um, I'm sorry, when is this? Uh, this is in the early 90s. Oh. Um, and uh, many of the Russians left, and many of the Russians continue to leave even now, um, uh, fearing, um, in, in the case of Kyrgyzstan, you know, some of the political instability that's affected the region. Um, so as far as trade was concerned, Central Asia had become entirely oriented towards uh, Russia. It was cut off from its neighbors, and it was reduced to a supplier of raw materials for more industrialized countries. And that role um, has stuck, kind of stuck with it. As far as migration has con it was concerned, it remained economically vi uh, vulnerable as the more educated people left in the 1990s. And um, things like healthcare and education um, today in many countries are at a lower level. Literacy rates are lower in, in many countries than they were uh, 25 years ago. Um, in part because of a loss of the subsidies, a loss of the educated uh, uh, people who, who left from many of these areas. Um, and so this has created great uh, challenges today. Um, trade and migration have always been a part of the legacy uh, of, of, of Central Asia, but um, uh, they have also, in the last 200 years, their reorientation has really disrupted um, uh, uh, its, um, its societies. Do you have any questions? Yes? I have a lot, but okay. I'll just ask one to start. So you said the reorientation, uh, they're not supplying so much to Russia anymore? Are most exports from Central Asia now to China? Um, actually, that's a good question. Um, I, it depends on what you're talking about. They are still very much oriented towards Russia. Um, but uh, now they can sell on world markets for a lot of things. So for example, Kazakhstan has actually played its hand pretty well. It's developed its oil industry, and it's found alternative routes and alternative markets for its oil and gas, for example. Um, and so it's, it's been able to actually make, it's, it's still a, a raw material supplier, but it, it's, it's, it's now dealing in the world market. Uh, Uzbekistan is the f still the fifth largest, I believe, fifth or sixth largest uh, uh, producer of cotton in the world. Where? Um, Uzbekistan, yeah, um, and and all and a number of other countries also produce cotton. So they're they're still supplying, but now it's they're supplying it to the world. Nonetheless, Russia is still kind of a, a focus because that's where all the the railroads go. That's where uh, many of the migrants go. Uh, most people know some Russian, and so um, trading with Russia, dealing with Russians, is much easier for them than dealing with say Chinese. Um, and so, while China is moving in, um, and other countries, Iran is building uh, bridges to Central Asia, uh, Turkey as well, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's become a little bit more open, but still sort of the, the Russia is the big, the big player. Yes, sir? It looked like from your graph of the growth of population from 1897 to whatever it was, 35 or something, that the Russians became the majority population. It looked like that. that Pretty much. much curve went way up. So is there, yeah. without migration, has there been a balancing of more towards, um, well, the Kazakhs were a big group. So if the Russians left, has it you know, more restored the kind of native population a little more? Or? I, I don't have the latest statistics, but I believe now Kazakhs are the largest group. Uh, I'm, I'm, in fact, I'm sure that they're the largest group. I, I'm not sure if they're the outright majority in, in Kazakhstan. Do you happen to know? I think uh, it, you have the other uh, way where, where you show the pie the charts. Mm. That yes. If you can put that on. Did that have some that, figures? I mean, it's older, of course, but it's not that different yeah. now. I think you saw it. Sorry. Pie chart. That one? Yeah. Oh. yeah. See, Kazakhstan at the top, I think it was at 1.41.9%. Yeah. That's the purple. Yeah, and uh, I think now Kazakhs are um, the majority, yeah. Yeah. but there is a still the, there's a really large Russian population there because for yeah. one reason Kazakhs accept Russian and Kazakh 
as both official languages, whereas in the other republics that's not the case. But you see how few Russians there are even at that time in these republics, so most of them left. Yeah. Uh, the Russians largely settled, and when they settled in rural areas, the, the one sort of exception to Central Asians in the villages, Russians in the cities, is northern Kazakhstan, where uh, the majority of the population in many of these areas is Russian, um, along the sort of border with Russia. Uh, yes, ma'am. So where did the Russians immigrate to? They just back to Russia. They're give anyone just the cities. In, in Russia, um, some of them, actually, I can say anecdotally, I don't know what the statistics are, but um, some uh, moved to the countryside of Russia. And they're, it's, it's funny, um, they, would, they would move back and they'd be amazed at how much water there was everywhere. <laughs> um, because in, in Central Asia, you really have to be smart about your water um, to, to make anything grow. You have to be very careful about channeling in the right places and, and taking care of rainfall and that sort of thing. They say, oh, the Russians around here, they just, they just wait for the rain to come. <laughs> they don't, you know, get out there and you know dig these little troughs, make sure that the irrigation is right. Um, so, uh, so they they did come back to settle somewhat in the countryside, um, especially if they were farmers beforehand. But for the most part, they went to the cities, and in the cities, they could get from the Russian government often um, special. Um, Russian government is, has a declining population, or had a declining population until recently. And they were very eager to increase the number of people coming into the city, uh, in, into the country, who were similar to them, who were Russians, however far back they, they had been a part of uh, the same country. And, um, and so they would give them free apartments. And so if you are not only a Russian, but um, one of the ethnic minorities of Russia who had ended up in Central Asia, like a Tatar, you could go back to Russia and get an apartment, usually in a small provincial city. It's not a great apartment, but you could you could basically have some you know social welfare provided for you if you were willing to move back. And many people took the deal and are taking it today. Yes, I think also when we say go back, of course, many of these people never lived in Russia, three four generations. You know, as Ben pointed out, you know they start settling in mid 1800s. So they happen to be ethnically Russian, but when they go to Russia, they were considered Central Asian culturally, you know. Yeah. And uh, for Germans, Germans have been there since Peter the Great. So yeah. when they go to Germany, they are really not going back to somewhere like that, right? Th that, this is a very good point. And thank you for catching me on that. Um, it's uh, there is a very big difference uh, for culturally for them. Um, I have I have friends who have moved from Central Asia to Moscow, and my, my one friend in particular. His family, he doesn't really know because it's not, it's not as common in many in, in, in Central Asia, in particular among immigrants to uh, some of these, these descendants of migrating groups that, that moved into the region, uh, to talk about their past very much. Unlike Americans, we love to talk about where we're from. Um, but, but Central Asians, uh, how am I doing in time, by the way? What's his next? Sorry, how's he doing? Okay. Fine. All right. Wonderful. Um, uh, Americans like to talk about their past, but but Central Asians um, uh, generally um, uh, they they kind of keep it quiet because very often there was political reasons mm -hmm. or other reasons why they wouldn't talk about it. The Soviet kind of mentality where you you kind of don't talk about your past because you might get in trouble um, has stayed with them. So he doesn't really know where his family is actually from, but he, he believes that they're, it, 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 he knows that they were Cossacks. He knows that they were from probably Southern Russia or Ukraine. Um, and they came to Central Asia in the early 1930s. They were fleeing hunger. Um, his grandfather grew up there, his father grew up there, he grew up there, and, uh, and then he went to Moscow. And in Moscow, he's just seen as, as he said, as a Central Asian. So while you know his passport says, and they have their nationality, their ethnic group printed in their passport, if you can imagine, his passport says Russian. But you know, it's it doesn't really matter because when when people see him on the street, they always think, oh, this guy is, is not from around here. He's not one of us. Uh, yes, sir. Um, when you were talking about the colonial strategy, so to speak, I think it was maybe was carried over from the Russian Empire period to under the Soviets uh, as um, 
separating the, the Russians who came in from the, the local population. It seems to me, my impression is that in many colonial experiences, the colonial masters coalesced with native people who then became their proxies to control the rest of the population. And I, I don't know, maybe that happened in Africa, I'm thinking of Vietnam and so on. Oh, it happened here too, yeah. But it is, so are these countries saddled today with this, you know, stratum of sort of, I don't know, colonialized masters who maybe have their own, in some other agenda, different from maybe the, the, um, the mass of people? What the... Is, is there sort of a, I don't know, a second wave that, you know, has to be cleared out before the, you know, the countries are really restored to the, the, the ownership, maybe, of, of the, the native original people there? Uh, th that's, that's a good question. Um, my understanding, and um, uh, Professor Eggman can correct me if, if uh, you, you might have a, a different one, um, is that uh, the co-optation happened with people who were already kind of in charge. And if, they, if, if those people weren't playing ball, then there were really severe consequences. And many of those people had to flee. Many of those people were killed um, in, in the various wars or in the rebellions. Um, there are, there's large populations of Kyrgyz, for example, who, not, not large, but numerous population of Kyrgyz who are in Turkey today or in Afghanistan. Um, and they fled from the Soviet Union. They were not playing ball with those people. But if you did play ball, um, then you got, um, then your, your, your children would be educated. You would be given a kind of a local position in the local administration. You'd be able to, um, uh, there were benefits in the colonial times to playing ball. And you, but, but it's not like this was an ethnic group. This was uh, part of the, these were aristocrats in the societies that existed before uh, the Russian uh, conquest. And so with all of the changes that happened, there were some aristocrats who played ball, and those people ended up um, uh, being, uh, becoming a part of the colonial, the colonial apparatus, the colonial system, as you might say. Um, so sorry, would you add? Yeah, absolutely right. Just to sort of add to that is when we look at this so-called quote-unquote civilized, civilizing mission, Russians weren't the same as French or British or others. So they don't really necessarily look down on the populations they sort of conquered, maybe at the beginning, and some probably did. But overall, I think, wouldn't you say that once you, you know, add of or ova to your last name and educated in Russian schools, they didn't really see you as backwards. So, so many Russian, so many Tatars, for example, it's the best example, who might have even converted to Christianity or even, if not, even edu educated under the imperial system, became part of the society. So, Russian colonialism is not the same as British or French colonialism. They sort of incorporated these people into their fold. And I think also, as you said, the elites in these places who became Bolsheviks mm -hmm. were incorporated just like the Russians. So, sort of a, I wouldn't say it's a benign colonialism, but it's quite different. And there are serious nuances between how the British and French, you know, treated their colonized peoples, whereas the and m most Central Asians don't feel that they were colonized. Right. That's actually a very good point. What I said was colony was Central Asians would disagree with my characterization. Right. right. <laughs> uh, yes, ma'am. Um, I have some Tartar friends, and they, they tell me differently. And I think it has to do with whether you're looking in or you're looking from the uh, outside. It, they, they're telling me that they, as well as their children, were never quite accepted or treated as the Russians. And I'm talking about people that made their way, so it's not, you know, that they had a lower position. So on one end, they were Russian, and on the other, internally, they 
know they are not Russian, and the Russians also know. Yeah. Okay? So since I myself am not an American born, I just see that as a more sophisticated way. Not benign, but a little bit more sophisticated. Okay? So it's because these things are never benign. I'm sorry. Sure, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and it really depends on what time period you're talking about. Um, in, from the 1860s up to the revolution was probably the worst time um, in terms of colonial, this colonial difference where especially people in the southern part, not, not so much Kazakhs, but the people in the southern part of, of Central Asia, what is today Uzbekistan, uh, Tajikistan, were really kept separate. And they, they would not be able to be integrated very easily. Um, but I mean, there, there, there's, there was certainly a continuum, and the Russians were moving very much along this long line. So that, nonetheless, as I, I, I mentioned, even in the times when things were good, as you would suggest, people knew themselves to be different somehow. Because they, if nothing else, they had it in their passport. Uh, if you were Tatar, for example, you were said, OK, Tatar, the Tatar Autonomous <coughs> Republic, which is a part of of, of, uh, of Russia is your homeland. If you're in Central Asia, this is not quite your home. You have that sort of vague conscientiousness, that, that the basic consciousness. Um, and so e even in those cases, there's this feeling that they're not quite treated the same, that peoples aren't always treated the same. Even while, um, as, as Professor Eggman said, um, the laws might, might say that you're, you're, you're on. Uh, yes? I just, yeah, didn't we hear about this most recently in terms of the Russian takeover of Crimea because there's a, a big Tatar population there and they were very fearful of what was going to happen when the Russians uh, gained control? Yeah. Um, I mean, that even made it into our newspapers. I mean. <laughs> right, right. In, in, actually, uh, and the Crimeans, uh, Tatars, are, are kind of an interesting case. Um, they had uh, been in the Russian Empire ever since. Um, the time of Catherine the Great, um, and uh, they were one of the punished peoples who were shipped out by Stalin's regime to Central Asia, and many of them lived in Uzbekistan and other areas until uh, the breakup of the Soviet Union, when many of them went back, and they started uh, living in Crimea, where they hadn't been allowed to live before. Um, and their association with Russia was with that deportation. And so when Russia comes in and takes over in an aggressive way, and you've got Putin in charge, um, they're seeing that as a repeat. And that's why they were so fierce and resisting um, the Russian takeover. And then didn't they actually, most of the deported nationalities were allowed to return earlier? Yeah. But Crimean Tatars were never allowed to return right. officially. So they're coming back on their own without the state's approval right. to, to settle. And this is a homeland for them before Ukrainians, before Russians. Crimea was a Tatar khanate. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. there, there were, yeah, there, was, there, were, there were various different regimes that governed different people. Right. Um, but it was, it was never easy to move just anywhere in the Soviet Union. The Crimean Tatars, though, were a special case where the locals just tried to keep them out. I just want to like do a comprehension check for myself. Sure. Um, so, if you were to split up the colonial period under the Russian mm -hmm. Silk Road, would it be pre nineteen sixteen, where they're a little nicer, than nineteen sixteen and after, when they're a little meaner after World War One, and then I'm just thinking you explaining this to teenagers. So, oh sure. Um, <laughs> and then Soviet era nineteen twenties to nineteen nineties. Um, the, that's how governance was different and the colonial experience and so for Central Asian people would be different in those three categories or would it be different categories? Um, that's a good question. I, I think I would split it up a little bit uh, differently but maybe have just a few more pieces. Um, 1800 to 1865, Russians are absorbing, uh, or 1730 to 1865, Russians are absorbing they're not in they're not in colonial colonization mode. They're in kind of trade mode, protection mode. Uh, make sure that you know everything is is uh, uh, is okay on our borders. 
1865 to uh, 1916 um, is a period of full-on colonization. We want cotton. We want markets. Uh, we are going to keep the, the Central Asian peoples at a distance. We are trying to be a European power, especially in the southern tier of, of Turkestan, or what was then Central Asia. Was the, the then name for Central Asia, that part of Central Asia, um, and uh, and we're uh, we're basically um, this this is our overseas colony. This is you know our Africa, our India. Um, from uh, the end of the Russian Civil War, so 1922 ish, uh, to um, 1930, we're building up. The Central Asians. We're really sorry. <laughs> uh, we're going to help the Central Asians. We're going to create for them territories. We're going to give them a little bit of self-governance within the Soviet system, with it up to a point. And then um, 1930 to 1991, um, Central Asia is again a very useful colony. Um, so if this this is not probably the way most people would split up that period um, necessarily because I'm talking more about trade and migration. My interest was always sort of economic history. But, um, but you see, and so you see various degrees of repression and accommodation and um, you know, either they give lots of welfare services or you know, sometimes they're, they're not giving anything, they're just taking and, and there's starvation. But, um, uh, but I think the critical thing is that um, it, uh, the 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 Russian the, the the Russian Empire needed its own overseas colony needed its own cotton producer, uh, and the Soviet state tried to think in different ways, but ended up falling into the same patterns, and those patterns persisted all the way up to 1991, where it's you know, this is this is where we get oil, this is where we get gas. Is that can I, yeah. Your so based on that, can I ask which which colonial model, which, you know, British, French, Mughal, Qing, which do they look more like when they're more benign and when they're more full on? When they're more full on, does that look kind of like French and British? I know you're saying they're not like French and British, but for the colonial relations, uh, what do they look more like if I, I'm explaining this to students? Um, I, I think at that time, I, I, I unfortunately didn't have many pictures of like the garden parties they would have, but uh, the garden parties they would have in Tashkent in the central administration, uh, you could almost, if they weren't Russian, take that out of India. You know, they've got, yeah, the, the, the Russian India, right. Um, so this, that's, that's the, that's sort of, they're, they're approaching it then anyway, um, at full on mode. At accommodation mode, they were saying, um, saying equal rights, but we still need the cotton. <laughs> um, and that would be the Soviet period. Um, and what other empire would that look like? Uh, um, it's really, you're kind of comparing apples to oranges in that right, way. Right, that's yeah, what just, teenagers do. Right. Right. I, need have them right. Right. I mean, if you... Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say yeah. that. I mean, <laughs> if you look at the Ottoman Empire, where they allowed, sorry Ben, no, 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 that uh, where they accommodated the Jews and the Christians to a point, mm -hmm. you know, of course you have to realize it changes from decade to decade, from century to century, but, um, you know, until the Ottomans start massacring Armenians in 1915, they have, uh, they value Armenians such a great deal, I mean, they're the top leaders in the, uh, <coughs> so you have, in Russia too, Russian Empire, you have some people like Velikanov, Kazakh leader, and various other people who move up into, you know, high levels of society. So there is some, you know, they value non-Russians. But as you pointed out, they never, it's not, you know, still the, 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 the Russian ethnic group is at the top. So there is a hierarchy. Maybe the closest comparison would be the Ottoman Empire, you know, to, to that. And, you know, I don't know how, I mean, British and French empires don't really resemble the Russian Empire mm -hmm. that way. I mean, maybe in trade relations they do, but um, in terms of dealing with their ethnic groups yeah. is closest to me the uh, Ottoman uh, Empire. I don't know. I mean, it's still an awkward 
comparison because yeah, yeah. I know, yeah. I know, I, I know. What's but like. you, you find at least the colonial administrators thinking most like Russian, uh, like British and French, in that later period. During the Soviet period, I mean, I, I think that actually American wouldn't be that far off, <laughs> simply because um, there there are parts of the U.S. today that are underserved and where we're just taking stuff out. Uh, North Dakota isn't all that different from parts of Kazakhstan at certain periods. Um, yes, sir. Um, so there are a couple of other stands. Oh, yeah. Um, and so as the Russians came down, is that where they hit the British or something? Is that what kind of, so or what's the? Afghanistan, what? Pakistan, you're talking yeah, about. Right. Um, so the Russians uh, never, uh, the, the border was the, the, a little bit different than it is today, but basically the extent of the five stands is the extent of the Russian Empire. That right. was the shape. Um, so why did it stop, that expansion stop there? Is that they, well, I don't know. The, the Afghans kicked the British out of uh, yeah. Afghanistan, and the Russians didn't, didn't I mean, they, they wanted to make sure that things were quiet there, but they really didn't want to occupy Afghanistan. They thought that, I think that they thought that that would be a bad idea. Um, so when they came in in the 80s uh, to try to straighten things out, I mean, they They just, were, uh, they were, they were also making a big mistake. Out again. Yeah. Yeah. So Afghanistan has kind of been like a bristly porcupine or something. It's kind of <laughs> kept, kept uh, these, these It's like people. a buffer zone, right? Especially yeah. if you see here the Wakhan Corridor. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes. It's like this finger separating the Russian Empire from the British Empire and sort of touching China and uh, Xinjiang area. So they left that area so the two empires didn't touch each other. And that yeah. became part of Afghanistan. I mean, yeah. it was always part of Afghanistan. It was. It was e ethnically, the people who live there are Kyrgyz. Yeah. Mostly. Um, but, you know, Kyrgyzstan didn't claim it, the Soviet Union didn't claim it. It was. It was it was always kind of it was observed originally in, uh, during this time as as a buffer zone. Uh, Afghanistan was uh, a center for trade. It was supposed to be a stabilizing influence, and it was really only in 19, 1979 uh, when it became a, a problematic place to have on your southern border. Before that, um, in the 1970s, it was a you know, there was a socialist government there. But if you go back to Genghis Khan, I mean, that was part of what they controlled through there, wasn't it? I mean, I don't know whether it was part of the Silk Road area, whatever, but I mean... Oh, certainly. And, and so if you were to look back historically to before 1800, uh, Afghanistan is much, you know, we, we, we wouldn't discuss it as being separate, something separate. It was, it was a part of this whole world. It was a part of these cities. It was a part of these, these, these empires. Um, the uh, you know great Uzbek poet, uh, probably the most famous Uzbek poet, is Alisher Navai. He was born in Herat, um, which is in Afghanistan, but he's he's known for writing in uh, sort of what is called Old Uzbek, or uh, he's also wrote in Persian. Um, and he was a part of this multilingual, multi-ethnic kind of world, and Afghanistan was part of it as well. And it's really only because of the the, the Russian and British competition in the, in the Russian Empire that we, we have the shape of these countries the way it is today. Uh, you may have in your references, but is there a book that kind of takes you from, you know, after Genghis Khan and tells you what happened in Central Asia, the, the story that you've been telling us, you know, up until, I don't know, the First World War, somewhere close to There, there are, are various ones. I, I don't know that I, if, I mean, yeah, the most recent one, if you want to use a shorter volume by Peter Golden, Central Asia in World History. Yeah. And I use that for my classes. I mean, you could use it in high school yeah. as you, you couldn't probably assign it as a high school book, but I think you could use it in your lectures. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a sweeping history begin from beginning yeah. to the end, right? So you have yeah. to be careful. Central Asia in world history. In world history. Yeah. Peter Golden. And um, and while there are, are are books out there that are comprehensive, there are very often they're they're not um, 
they focus on one region and they neglect others. Right. Um, so if there's a, a one that you find on, on, on Central Asia during the Russian times, usually it's very bad about what happened before Russia came. Right. Or if you find one that is, is very good from the standpoint of, of uh, the, the early modern period up to 1800, usually it's very dismissive of the Russian experience and it's, um, it's very dismissive of the countries that exist today. They don't sort of, sort of see them as real countries. Um, so it, it's been only recently that there have been any real books written on the whole period. Right. I mean, to, I don't know, maybe it's out of place, but my own education in the United States in the 50s and 60s, which is when I was in high school and college, left out that whole part of the world. Oh, yeah. yeah. So ever it's since, I've been trying to, you know, <laughs> get the pieces of it. And you have to change. Yeah. 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 Unfortunately, yeah, it's, it's, still, it's still sort of not as I said, it's sort of the Silk Road ended and or ended. <laughs> it stopped being as important to uh, historians of China and 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 Europe, and and it sort of fell off the map. Can I ask, can what I are the universities? <laughs> Sorry. What are the universities that have areas of expertise in teaching at the undergraduate or graduate level on Central Asia? I mean, there. University of Washington. <laughs> Washington. University of Washington. Yeah. University of Washington, Seattle. Uh, Indiana University. Yeah. That's where one of my students just graduated. And I'm sitting here wishing he were here. I'm going to have to send him. That's exactly where he went. That's where I went. And Did you? Uh, really good situations. Yeah. yeah they do. Michigan, right? Michigan has some. And Miami and Ohio. Miami, Ohio has right. only two people. Um, right. Harvard used to have some people. That's right. That was, that was good. Right. Um, and the leading scholar of Uzbekistan, Adib Khalid, is in Carleton. Carleton. Yes. Carleton. Yeah. Carleton is in uh, Minnesota. Oh, it's uh, near. Yeah, Paul. that's right. Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, these uh, countries uh, they they speak the Turkic Tur Turkic languages. Now, how close are these languages related to Turkish, and how close are they related to each other? And now that they're independent, are they still using the Cyrillic script, or are they using the Roman script, or are they using the Arabic script? Um, uh, I, on, on the first question about how close they are, I'm going to defer to the native you Turkish speaker. But I think there's there's uh, a higher degree of mutual intelligibility than there is between English and German, let's say, or English and other German. Um, uh, at the same time, there's uh, some, some important lexical differences, um, uh, differences in, um, in, in pronunciation. So that um, uh, if the, with very similarly related, uh, such as Kyrgyz and Kazakh, there is, uh, I, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, more or less that they can speak to together about, about most things and they can modify their speech a little bit and both basically understand each other. Um, between Kyrgyz and let's say Turkish, which is sort of a, a larger leap, um, uh, there's less mutual intelligibility, but if there's, there's a good deal that you can glean from reading, you can, um, uh, you can kind of stumble around a little, but it's a little bit harder. Um, right. Would that be? Yeah, I think the Turkic language is also split into subgroups. Mm -hmm. So Turkish that is spoken today uh, comes from Oğuz group, which is close to Turkmen and Aziri, yeah. whereas Kazakh and Kyrgyz are Kipchak group that, for example, I studied Kyrgyz and Kazakh. It took me three months to be able to, you know, read and write, <laughs> whereas Uzbek was in like in a couple of weeks, you, mm. you can. But the uh, vocabulary, as Ben said, in Ka Kyrgyz and Kazakh are uh, is, it's very different than what's spoken in Turkey or Turkmen Turkmenistan, and yet then there is in in Uzbekistan there's an area that happens to be Uz uh, Oğuz, so I can understand them really well, whereas I can't understand Uzbeks in the northern part of Uzbekistan. So there is a you have to sort of be, and then Cyrillic is. What's the most current situation? So the current situation is that um, at least uh, the four Turkic, uh, Tajik is a, a per Persian language, but, uh, but the four Turkic uh, nation states, uh, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, 
um, all eventually have some program to switch to Latin alphabet, mm. yeah. um, like Turkish. Um, uh, Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan already have officially in all their formal documents. In fact, the Uzbeks throughout the Soviet period would teach alongside the Cyrillic alphabet. They'd also teach Uzbek in, um, in, in uh, I've seen grammars from the Soviet times in, uh, the, uh, in, in the Latin alphabet. So they, they never actually left it, um, even though they officially was, it was Cyrillic. Um, uh, in Kazakhstan, I think they're, they're making, trying to make progress towards it. I think they're introducing it in schools, but it's, it's not official yet, as right. far as I know. And in Kyrgyzstan, they want to do what they're doing in Kazakhstan, but they just don't really have as much their act together. I mean, they, they have a program to introduce it in the schools, but they haven't been able to organize the and train up people. It's, it's an expensive operation. It requires retraining a lot of teachers who've learned only Cyrillic, so it's, it takes some doing. Yes? In the few minutes that we have remaining, um, I sort of have to ask a question that's not very focused, but you haven't said very much about uh, Persian Mm -hmm. slash Iranian influence right. during the period that you discussed? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so there were, uh, I, was, I was talking mostly about um, the uh, trade and the trade with Russia mm -hmm. as uh, kind of what was, was, was shaping a lot of events that, that subsequently happened. Uh, there was uh, no, there, there was trade with um, Persia before, during, and after uh, the uh, Russian Empire and Soviet uh, period. Um, it wasn't as pronounced after the Russians got involved and built railroads. Um, the Persian, um, uh, but there, there were Persians living in many of uh, these areas. The, Turkic, uh, the, the Tajikistan is a, um, uh, is, has a, a Pers Persian language officially. Um, as um, its language, and in fact, many of the people who live in Samarkand and Bukhara, um, and many of these these areas, which are yellow in this map, because that reflects official statistics, in fact speak both Uzbek and Tajik. And um, Persian is really was the language of the settled peoples of Central Asia, the language of the cities, the language of administration, um, all the way up through the 1800s. Uh, in, in many parts. Um, it, uh, it depends on which particular government you're talking about, but um, uh, it was really it was really the urban the urban tongue. It was the, the, the language of the people who'd been living there the longest, who hadn't come in more recently from some migration. Um, and their connections to um, uh, cities in Iran was was a very long standing. And so there were, there was always a lot of trade going back and forth. And in fact, this was a market for uh, the um, uh, many of the trade goods coming from Russia, the manufactured goods. This was one of the that places. That would even to be pre-Islamic, right? Um, oh, it would be yeah. certainly pre-Islamic. <laughs> like it was. Way. It goes back. It goes back <laughs> since millennium. before. Yeah, yeah. before uh, really we had very good records. Um, there was trade going um, between uh, between Persia and the, the um, various principalities of, of Russia uh, from the from the time that they were uh, pretty much created in, in the nine hundreds. Trade with Persia going back that far. What about the maritime trade on the Caspian Sea between the eastern border of Central Asia and Azerbaijan <coughs> and southern Russia? Um, this was a critical, a critical route for um, getting uh, this. this uh, the, the first railroad that was built, in fact, in Central Asia was built from uh, Krasnovodsk, which is about here, all the way to Tashkent. It was, it was along here. It wasn't over this way. So. They would, they would, this was a major highway for trade. It was a major highway with, um, with Iran as well. Um, uh, uh, and uh, it, it became uh, somewhat less important once the, there was a, a, a railroad that went all the way from uh, Russia proper to, um, to Central Asia. It became less significant, but nonetheless, it was always very, very, very important. And, and it is um, to this day. For example, they, they built, um, uh, and, and have had plans to build um, um, gas and oil pipelines from Central Asia through Azerbaijan, through um, Georgia to um, Turkey, uh, with the aim of avoiding all of this trade dependence on Russia. And uh, we haven't talked very much about energy, um, but uh, but 
that is the major commodity of the region. It's no longer as much cotton, and um, and that route, that east-west route, has been critical. What about the poppy heroin? Um, it grows very well <laughs> in Central Asia. Um, the, uh, it was, uh, I actually, uh, I I, I, I'm, uh, it, it was cultivated for, for a very long time. Um, it was not um, a major, uh, I don't think it was a major export in the, uh, during the, 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 the Russian Empire, although this is where, if, if you had to get in the Russian Empire, this is where you'd get it. Um, during the Soviet times, the part that I studied, um, they had a, they grew poppies for medicine in many of these places. They had you know, poppy farms uh, for uh, medical use, morphine, and whatever. Um, uh, in in Kyrgyzstan and I'm sure in other places as well. Uh, since uh, the 1970s and 80s, of course, it's been very big in, in Afghanistan. It's become you know Central Asia is now on uh, the major transit route for heroin from Afghanistan to world markets. Um, and of course, that's most of the heroin. Take one more. Sure. Yeah. Um, when you mentioned cotton, in the past couple of years, I read some article about uh, maybe a new school of uh, approach to history or something. And uh, it might be at Harvard and some other places. Maybe one of the best examples of that was some huge work about cotton. Maybe it's tracing history through studying an e economic uh, mm -hmm. phenomenon or something like that. Oh. And I just, I don't know if you're familiar with that. I don't even no. know the, the title of the book or the author or anything like that, but some big work about cotton. And I just wondered if you knew anything about it, whether this story was part of that. Uh, do, do you have any? Well, knowledge? I think people are moving in the history profession away from just doing history of Uzbekistan. So there are working on cotton, so they may be talking about southern United States and in context, in larger context. So, you know, the new trend in history is really you know, away from one country, one place. Um, so maybe that's what you're talking about. But also people are writing like Douglas Northrup and others are writing about, you know, earthquakes. And not just Uzbekistan, but they're looking at other places. So. You know, that's the new trend, maybe that's what you're talking about. And commodities is one of them. Yeah. And so no more we are writing histories about, you know, locations that are isolated. You know, we have to connect them. Maybe that's what we're talking about. I, I will yeah. say if it's not a part of that book, if it's not part of that project, then it should be because right. this, yeah. has been, this has been critical. Yeah, that like it might be a key right. part of that story. Yes. Um, so during the colonization sort of of that area of Central Asia, was there a writer like a Chinua Achebe who's writing about that experience of colonization or decolonization? Uh, what sort of, it can be storytelling that's a, a movies that depict that experience of Central Asian people or, or books, are there good stories? Um, there are starting to be a lot of uh, pretty good um, compendia of um, primary sources which are, are kind of short, but, but have a description. Um, uh, I'm thinking of Ron Sellers. Ron Sellers and Scott Levi. Scott Levi. Levi. What was the name again? Ron Sellers. Ron Sellers. R-O-N-S-E-L-A. And his co-author is Scott Levi. Okay. Scott L-E-V-I. But that's right. pretty modern. It's pretty modern, but, but it has description of uh, British merchants in um, sort of this, this area um, in the 1700s, kind of what they saw, their experience of, of doing trade, their experience of interacting. And, there are, there are, um, and then there's also um, a description of some of the brutal rush of the region. So it's, it goes up to, I mean, they have the Gug Tepe kind of Right. Massacre. And I will talk about some authors and other things, in my, so that might give you a good chance. We have one minute until you're done. Okay. <laughs> so we really were, we're um, taking good advantage of Ben here. <laughs> and are there any more? Are there any other questions? Thirty seconds. Well, along the same lines, how about novels, historical novels? Because sometimes those also 
appeal to a broader <laughs> Yeah, it's crazy. Um, crazy choice. I, uh, the, when, when I was uh, learning about the region, I found that the short stories and novels of Chinggis Aitmatov right. were A-I-T-M-A-T-O-V, um, Aitmatov. Um, I'll have a slide on that. So okay. Yes. okay, good. Um, but he, he was um, sort of very well known. He, he kind of writes a little bit in the style of Gabriel Garcia Marquez or something like that. Um, and uh, he, um, he has a lot of story, shorter stories as well as novels about, um, written after the wor World War II about kind of life, but also reflecting on a lot of these historical legacies. Well, thank you very much, Ben. That's 